How's it going, folks? I am Brother Matthew, and welcome to Christian Coffee Time, where we sit down together to study the Word of God. And today we're going to be picking up our study of the Gospel of John, and we're up to chapter 18. And we're going to take a look at some of the things that it says in this chapter, and we're going to use the three points of the Christian faith, the three points of Bible study, and we're going to be, uh, again, examining these things, see how can we learn from these things? How can we learn from the story? How can we learn from these principles? What other aspects of Scripture speak about this? So I hope that this would be a help and a blessing to you. I hope this would be an encouragement to you. So um, if you haven't seen the broadcast that we did throughout this week, please make sure you uh, are able to just take a moment to view over those as well and to you can skim through those and uh, glean through them they got a lot of questions that we covered this week a lot of different topics that we've discussed so i hope that uh that these things are encouraging to you and you aren't being hesitant in asking questions i'm always inviting that i'd like people to ask questions if you have biblical questions make sure you bring them up because this is what it's for uh, these broadcasts are for this and yes, yes, I got new fabric bookmarks for my Bible. They're really nice. So it's a lot easier to use than the big clunky ones. So um, yesterday we covered a lot of ground as well in um, discussing the Godhead. We discussed the identity of Christ. We did a talk on Isaiah 53 and then a ton of other the topics that came after that, everything from atheism to just random Bible questions, and uh, please make sure you check that out, and if you have any more questions from that, uh, you can always let me know, and I'd be able to be happy to write them down, and we can bring them up when we have a moment, and we're just delaying just until more people can join in before we get started. Greetings, folks, greetings. And so, please grab your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 18. John chapter 18. We're getting close to the end of the of the book. And I have an idea. I was thinking of maybe diving into um, Galatians or Ephesians. Um, afterwards, we'll see how it goes. I know some have asked about Revelations, but um, I'm not... Well versed in revelations, I'm an evangelist. I focus on uh, the evangelistic principles and teachings. My dad, however, is the revelations expert. So I've been working on him to try to convince him into either writing some things down or maybe even possibly joining on broadcast at some time to do a talk on revelations. We'll see how that goes. So keep your fingers crossed. So. Um, I do plan on it sometime eventually doing a talk on Revelation. My knowledge of Revelations is not as deep as his, but we'll see how it goes. But anyways, for now, right now, we're going through the book of John, the Gospel of John. Okay, so, quick question. Where in John, where in the Gospel of John... Does Jesus flat out say that he's the Christ Messiah? Where in the Gospel of John does Jesus flat out say he's the Christ Messiah? Someone should know that one. Where in the Gospel of John does Jesus flat out say he's the Christ Messiah? Someone should know that. We've gone over that so many times. And yesterday we went over that about a hundred thousand times. So let me know. Where do you think? Whereabouts, where in the Gospel of John does Jesus flat out say He's the Christ Messiah. Do you remember? John 
John 4, 25 and 26. That's right. John 4, 25 and 26. Where in the Gospel of John <clears throat> does Jesus flat out call himself the I Am? And how many times? Where in the Gospel of John does Jesus flat out call himself the I Am? And how many times? These kinds of questions are important because they help you remember the references, the details of this thing, and it helps helps show me that people are actually listening to the Bible study. So, where in the Gospel of John does Jesus flat out call himself the I Am, and how many times? been over that one a number of times it's a very famous passage so let me know where was it where in the gospel of john did jesus call himself the i am and how many times we'll get to the bible study when people answer these questions so i got i got just a couple more just a couple more after this one these are very important. These are some of the key passages of the Bible that speak about the, the identity of Jesus and proving who he is. So we see in John chapter 4, verses 25 and 26, Jesus flat out calls himself the Christ Messiah. John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Chapter 8. In John chapter 8, Jesus calls himself the I Am. And he calls himself the I Am five times. Five times in John chapter 8, Jesus calls himself the I Am. Specifically, we look for John 8.24 and John 8.58. It is where Jesus calls himself the I Am. Unless you believe that I Am, you'll die in your sins. And before Abraham was, I Am. So John chapter 8, specifically 24 and 58 are the two famous ones. But he calls himself the I Am five times in John chapter 8. Okay, so next we want, want another question. Where in the Gospel of John does Jesus claim to have a personal power over life and death? Where in the Gospel of John does Jesus flat out claim to have power over life and death? No. Where in the Gospel of John does Jesus personally claim to have power over life and death? So we see in John chapter 4, he claims to be the Christ Messiah. John chapter 8, he claims to be the I Am. And where in the Gospel of John does Jesus personally claim power over life and death? These are very, very, very important passages. They really help emphasize our faith and they help us in being able to prove the identity of Christ to people of other religions and beliefs and such, helping them to understand who Jesus is. These are very, very, very important. So, one more time. Where in the Gospel of John did Jesus personally claim power over life and death? John chapter 10, verse 18. John chapter 10, verse 18. Jesus says, no man take, takes my life from me. I have power to lay down my life and take it up again. Okay, where in the Gospel of John does Jesus say he personally gives eternal life? Where he personally grants and gives eternal life. Where in the Gospel of John does Jesus personally claim to be the one that gives eternal life? Do you know? Where in the Gospel of John 
does Jesus personally claim to grant and give eternal life? Do you know? So we saw in John chapter 4, he claims to be the Christ Messiah. John chapter 8, he claims to be the I Am. John chapter 10, in John chapter 10, verse 18, he claims to have personal power over life and death. Now, where in the Gospel of John does Jesus personally claim to be the one who gives and grants eternal life? Where in the Gospel of John? John chapter 10, verses 27 and 28. John chapter 10, verses 27 and 28. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life. And I give unto them eternal life. <laughs> close, close, but it's John chapter 10, verses, 20, uh, verses 27 and 28. Okay, so, why is it important to know these references? Why is it important to know these points? Because it proves what it is we believe in. It proves the person of Jesus Christ, according to Scripture. That he's not just some angel. He's not just some prophet. He's not just some holy man. He's not just some ascended master. He is God. He is God. This is so, so important. This is so important to be able to get across these points and to show these things to the people because the Jesus of every single other belief system is not the Jesus of the Bible. Their Jesus is limited. Their Jesuses are false. As you read through Matthew, there's a number of times where Jesus talks about false Christs will arise. And this will be people claiming to be Christ, but also other Christs of other religions. Their Jesuses. So let's take a look at Jesus according to John chapter 18. Many will come in my name. That's right. All right, so please take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 18. John chapter 18. And we're going to do a slow read through here. We'll see how far we get. Uh, we might finish the chapter. It might not. All depends on how much information we wind up going across. So there's 40 verses. We'll see how it goes. I do not I do not like setting limits. Uh, we just go until Spirit of God tells us that's enough. So we'll see how it goes here. So please turn to John chapter 18. Again, we're going to be using the three points of the Christian faith, the three points of Bible study, which are what? Someone tell me. Someone tell me. What are the three points of the Christian faith, the three points of Bible study? What are the three points of the Christian faith, the three points of Bible study? Today is quiz day. <laughs> what are the three points of the Christian faith, the three points of Bible study? It'd be so much more nerve-wracking if this is all in person. <clears throat> Interpretation, application. What's the third one? What's the third one? Interpretation, application. What's the third one? <laughs> well, we look at it this way. Interpretation is the what, application is the how, and the third one is the, so we see reading the context, learning the cross-referencing, and then what do you do when all, with all of this? What do you do with all the information that you've gotten? And the Y stands for what? What do you now do? <clears throat> with all of this information, with all the studying and all the cross-referencing. What do you do with it? It's 
See, this is why it's so important to go over and over and over and over and over and over and over the information. You then apply it to yourself for demonstration. <laughs> it's personal demonstration. Interpretation, application, demonstration. To demonstrate the faith. Demonstrate what you've learned. So you got the what, the how, and the why. Uh, the what, the how, and the why. The context. The context of the narrative. You then study the specific details of the thing. And then you apply it to yourself. So you see book learning, the theory, and then the, uh, and then the practical. Then the practical. So you got theory and practical, the two big main points. When you break them down, you see this. You see the reading, the studying, and then the applying and the demonstration of it. So that's what we're going to be doing with this. So John chapter 18, we're going to be using these three points, going through this and taking a look at a couple things. All right, so you ready? So John chapter 18, verse 1. John chapter 18, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words... He went forth with his disciples over the brook Cedron, where was a garden, into the which he entered with his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. All right. You know, we've read this story many, 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 many times. We know this very well about the betrayal of Jesus and how it took place and the, then the trial and the crucifixion, all this. We know it very well, but when we actually start looking at it like as if we're there and we start looking at the matter of the heart and all of this, it really brings it down to earth, and it's more than just a story. For example, take a look at this. Judas Iscariot. I was thinking about this the other day. When Jesus first started his ministry, he called his disciples and and uh, he taught them and trained them, and then he sent them out for a while to go and preach and teach, and then they came back. But it says he Jesus appointed 12 disciples to go and do this. <clears throat> And one of the twelve disciples that Jesus gave power to preach the gospel and cast out devils and heal the sick was Judas Iscariot. Let that sink in for a moment. One of the twelve disciples that Jesus gave personal power to be able to preach the gospel, heal the sick, and cast out devils was Judas Iscariot. I spent a great deal of time wondering why. Why? Why? Why Judas? Why Judas is scary? And I got thinking, you know, well, it's not Judas's power. It has nothing to do with Judas. It goes to show that the name of Jesus Christ is not limited. It doesn't matter who speaks the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is never limited. The name of Jesus spoken has great power. The gospel of Jesus Christ has power. That it goes to show that the kingdom of God, the power of God, and the name of Jesus Christ and the gospel cannot be limited. Even the devils know this and tremble. It goes to show as well that people in the church, sitting in the pews, week after week after week after month after year after year, could possibly not be saved themselves and that they are very religious and very devoted and all of this and they love the name of Jesus and everything but they themselves aren't saved. I have seen that again and again and again and again and again. So many people go into church year after year after year after year praying, reading the Bible, being faithful but not save themselves. Judas Iscariot 
traveled with Jesus for three years. For three years. Judas sat with Christ, was taught by Christ, heard Christ, spoke with Christ, saw the miracles, heard the teachings, heard the doctrines, all of it, and he wasn't saved. He even spoke of Jesus. He even witnessed of Jesus. He even cast out devils by the name of Jesus. He preached the gospel by Jesus, and he wasn't saved. Many in that day will cry, Lord, Lord. Many in that day will cry, Lord, Lord. It's terrifying to think that people could believe, say they believe in Jesus say they love the gospel, say they love the word of God, and not be saved themselves. Now, why? Why? Because Judas didn't make it personal. He never made it personal. He never rep repented of his sins, believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, and made it personal. No, it doesn't say anything about that. Now, when we take a look at John chapter 18, we see something else that, that's kind of interesting. Judas traveling and living with Jesus, with the other disciples for three years, saw and heard and experienced the mighty, mighty teachings and miracles of Jesus Christ with all the other disciples. Then what do we see happening in verse 3? Okay, when we read the text that Judas then having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. <laughs> Do you realize what happened here in verse 3? Judas failed to notice and understand that Jesus is the Christ, the mighty God, manifested in the flesh. And that if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, confess the, the belief of your heart, you're saved. You must repent of your sins and believe on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Of Jesus Christ, you must understand that you're a sinner and you must be saved. He died on the cross for your sins. This is who he is. This is what he came for. This is what he came to do. And he taught this and showed this and he emphasized this. We're all sinners. Judas didn't realize this. He just saw Jesus as a man. He just glazed over. He didn't let the depth of this reach into his heart and he didn't make it personal. To Judas, Jesus was just a man. Jesus was not the Christ to him. Jesus was not God to him. He was just a man. That's why he came at Jesus with torches and weapons and soldiers to arrest him. Look between the lines. Look between the lines. He cometh with lanterns and torches and weapons at Jesus. Why would you need weapons? Why would you need an army? What do you think he's going to do? Jesus is a man of peace. He's never done anything wrong in his entire life. He's never said anything wrong. He's never thought anything wrong. He's never done anything wrong. He, because he's infinitely pure and holy, just, righteous and true. In him was no sin. He did no sin. He knew no sin. He's God, holy, mighty, almighty God, manifest in the flesh. What you doing coming at Jesus with an army and weapons? <laughs> it goes to show the delusion. The mighty, mighty delusion. The mighty delusion upon the mind of Judas Iscariot. Jesus, therefore... Now look at verse 4. I want to show you something here. When you pay attention to the specific words, it's amazing how the Word of God comes alive. Look at this, verse 4. Pay attention to the specific words. Jesus, therefore... 
What's the next three words in verse 4? Jesus, therefore, what are the next three words in John 18, verse 4? Jesus, therefore, what are the next three words? What does it say? Knowing all things. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things. Do you know what that says? Jesus, therefore, knowing all things. Do angels know all things? Do prophets know all things? Do apostles know all things? Do holy men know all things? So what does this go to show? What does this go to show? Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? Now, this is something very important. This question. Whom seek ye? If we go back to the beginning of the chapter, go back to John. Go back to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Jesus asked this question at the very beginning of his ministry. When Jesus was calling his disciples in John chapter 1, verse 37. John chapter 1, verse 37. And the two disciples of John the Baptist heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following and saith unto them, What seek ye? So Jesus is repeating the same thing again, this time a little differently. But, but he says in verse 38, What seek ye? And they said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? And they call him Master. We see respect. We see respect and honor being given to him here when Jesus says, Whom seek ye? Then we go to John chapter 18. We see Judas Iscariot coming with the soldiers and weapons and everything. And Jesus says, Whom seek ye? They said unto him, Jesus of Nazareth. No respect. No honor. A completely different attitude. So we see the attitude the attitude difference of those who come to Jesus. Those who say they love Jesus. Look at how they respect his name. Look at how they respect his teachings. Look at how they respect his person. How they respect the image of Jesus Christ that is being portrayed through you. The, the respect that you give unto Christ shows how you believe in him. Judas followed Jesus for three years. He wasn't saved. And he didn't really have respect of Jesus. How do you know that? Take a look at what happened when Mary broke the alabaster box of ointment on Jesus. What did Judas do? He got mad. And then Jesus told him off. What did he do? He got mad at Jesus for telling him off. And that's when he started to maul the things in his heart of how he might betray him. The way you treat Jesus, the way you treat Jesus, the way that you show respect to his word shows the belief of your heart. Jesus says, Whom seek ye? We look at the same question when Jesus asked Peter, Peter, but whom say ye that I am? And Peter says, Thou art the Christ, and we aren't sure of it. But Peter spoke a little too quickly, because Peter 
spoke for everyone else. Now, as from what we can probably surmise, is that it was true for all of the disciples except Judas. All of the disciples except Judas believed that Jesus was the Christ. Because obviously Judas didn't. Whom seek ye? Then they answered, Jesus of Nazareth. What does Jesus say in response? What does Jesus say in response? They say, we're seeking Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. Notice he is italicized. As soon then as he had said unto them, I am, which in the Greek is ego emi, which means the always existing one. That's the I am name of God. And as soon as he said unto them, I am, they went backward and fell to the ground. Now, it's interesting. When you really break these things down, <clears throat> and you take a look at this, Judas showing no respect of Jesus. Coming at Jesus with soldiers and weapons and all this to arrest him with an army. Okay. And showing no respect to Jesus when he says, what are you looking for? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus says, I am. Claiming the I am name of God. And they all fall over backwards. Now that's interesting. Showing the power of the name of God. Knocking this army completely backwards onto the ground. Now why did he do that? Why did Jesus do it? See I like to break things down. And look at it from like a Sherlock Holmes type of. Uh, type of way. There's breaking it down to look at all the, the, the clues of the mysteries of these subtle things like this. Why did that happen? We know it did happen, but why? Jesus was demonstrating his power. A gentle demonstration of his power. He could have just snapped his fingers and they would have been obliterated. He could have just spoken a word and the army of heaven could have descended upon them. Jesus could have called down fire upon them like he did like God did on Sodom and Gomorrah. He could have spoken a word and could have removed from them the breath of life. But what did he do? All he did was say his name and he just he allowed just a simple demonstration of his power to knock them over backwards to cause them to realize who they were dealing with you know god does that a lot of times for people too he gives people many many chances many chances to see and hear and understand the truth People who've gone to church week after week after week after month after month after year after year after year not saved themselves or not fully understanding, could be saved and not fully understanding the full implication of the severity of the power of the faith. And he shows again and again and again and again demonstrations of his power by answering prayers and helping and provision and need and, and, and comfort and everything else in between. Gentle demonstrations of his power so you could realize who he is. And some people, like the Israelites in the wilderness, seeing the, the power of God on Egypt, parting the sea, the, the manna from heaven, the water from the rock, all of, all of the power and the might and the wonders of God. And what do they do? They still make a golden idol. They still make the golden calf. Even in the face of all of the demonstrations of the power and the promise and the goodness of God. Because what happens? Yeah, Jesus says, render not evil for evil. 
What happens here after they all fall backwards? After he speaks his name, yeah, we can defend ourselves, but not to go above and beyond what is necessary. And, and Jesus says, I am, and they all fall over backwards. What then does Jesus do? He asks the question again. Now that you know who Jesus is, he just demonstrated his power. He says it again. I would say leave the house. Go somewhere safe. Call the police. Leave. You don't have to, there is no obligation to have to stay under such a thing. There's no obligation biblically where you'd have to stay under such a thing. Leave. Until it calms down and pray about it. Jesus then asked the question again. Whom seek ye? Now you had a moment to, to realize the severity of this. Who he really is. That by a single declaration, by a single name, by a single word, he can knock you straight backwards. Whom seek ye? And they said again, Jesus of Nazareth. They still didn't care. They still didn't care. They didn't care that Jesus is the Christ. They didn't care that Jesus is God. They didn't care that he healed the sick. They didn't care he raised the dead. They didn't care he fed the thousands. They didn't care he healed the blind. He healed the leper. He healed the lame. They didn't care he fed the thousands. He walked on water, water to wine. They didn't care he preached the truth and he preached the gospel and peace and love and mercy and all these things. They didn't care. They had no respect for him. No respect. Jesus of Nazareth. Not calling him rabbi. Not, not recognizing him for who he is. Not taking into consideration that the, every single detail. If you do not believe me for my very words, then believe me for my works, Jesus says. Yes, he, God gives a chance to all. He is not willing that any should perish. God does not want people to die unsaved. He'll, he goes to the ends of the earth to find them. He goes to the nth degrees to save them. But again, it's up to you. He only can go so far. God is not going to forcefully save you. He's not going to save you against your will. He's not going to grab you by the scruff of the neck and the seat of the pants and hurl you into the kingdom. He's going to stand before you and demonstrate his power. He's going to tell you. He's going to show you. He's going to, he's going to shake you up. But it's up to you. It's up to me. We have to see this and recognize this. And we have to acknowledge it. And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Not recognizing him for who he is. And Jesus answered, I've told you that I am. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way. And Jesus says, I, I told you this is who I am. I told you that I'm the I am. He says right there, the I am. That's the that's ego e me. In that verse right there. In verse 8. It, again, verse 8. Jesus says, I told you. I'm the I am. But ye believe not. Jesus then makes a plea for his disciples. Okay. You don't want to believe in me. Would you at least let these ones, my disciples, go away? Leave them alone. It's me you want. Jesus pleading for his disciples that the saying might be fulfilled which he spake of them which thou gavest me I lost none. Then Simon Peter <laughs> impulsive Peter impulsive Peter having a sword 
drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. <laughs> the servant's name was Malchus. Now for this we want to go to Luke chapter 22. Go to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22 and we want verse 49. Nope, that's not it. Well, I think it's Luke chapter 21. I think I can't even read my own writing. Oh yeah, yeah, chapter 21. Oh, <laughs> you see, I'm dyslexic. Sometimes when I even look at a number in my brain, I see it as a different number. Or I think of a number and I say the wrong number. I was looking at chapter 23 the whole time. Not realizing it's, chap I, it's chapter 22. I want, I thought 23 was 20. So there you see it. There you go. <sighs> okay, so Luke chapter 22, verse 49. When they were, which were about him saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? And one of them, Peter, smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Okay, that was Peter. Then Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. And he touched his ear and healed him. <laughs> Alright, so go back to John 18. So Peter drew out his sword, swung it, and cut off the ear of the ser of one of the servants of the high priest. His name was Malchus. Okay, that would have been pretty dramatic. That would have been pretty graphic. There would be screaming. There would be blood. There would be chaos. Everyone's shouting. Okay, that's Luke chapter 22, starting at verse 49. 49 to 53. So we see this happens. So all this chaos and all of a sudden everything is just going crazy. And then what does Jesus say? Then said Jesus to Peter, put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Peter, do, uh, Peter, Peter thought in the moment, impulse of Peter, that, you know, you could use physical violence and you could force you could use violence and physical means to carry out the things of God. You see, the thing about the faith is that it has nothing to do with us. It's not by force. It's not by violence. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Yeah. But what does Jesus say? Put up your sword in the sheath. Turn the other cheek. If one strikes you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. Do violence to no man. Render not evil for evil. Love your enemies. Bless those that curse you. Pray for those that despitefully use you. What does Jesus say? We are to be the peacemakers. We're to be pacifists, technically, according to Jesus' teaching. According to Jesus' teaching, we're to be pacifists. To love our enemies. If they strike us, turn to them the other cheek. If they take your coat, give them your cloak also. Ask nothing in return. Give it all to the Lord. He'll look after you. And the Lord says, if any raise a hand against you, he'll deal with them. The vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. Do not seek vengeance upon them, but rather give it to the Lord. He will deal with them. And we see here, these ones come to arrest Jesus. Then all of this going on, and they show disrespect on us. But what does Jesus do? To show the love of God. Even in this very moment, these ones have come to arrest him and beat him and spit on him and crucify him. What does he do? The Lord will bless you for that. 
The Lord will bless you for that. That's the, that's the absolute epitome of the love of Jesus Christ. The world doesn't understand that. It shocks them. The Spirit of God will use you so mightily for that. The fact that you would not raise a hand and you stood there and you showed the power of the Lord, that will work wonders upon your family. You watch. You watch. That will work wonders. Show them the peace, the grace, the humility, the meekness, and the power of God in peace. In peace. Bless and curse not. Bless them that hate you. Pray for them that despitefully use you. That when they accuse your good works, they would be ashamed that falsely accuse you. Jesus reaches down and grabs the ear of Malchus. Malchus came to curse and blaspheme and beat and arrest Jesus. And what does Jesus do? Picks up his ear and puts it back on his head and heals him. <laughs> he doesn't fight him. Hey, how's it going? Thanks for joining in. So we're in John chapter 18. So we see Jesus blessing those who would curse him. Now why? What does the Bible say? The Bible says, The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Then you see that even though I could curse God and hate upon God and all this, He's still good to me. Even though while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. While I was yet a sinner, an enemy of God, a child of the devil, an heir of hell, He still died for me. I deserve hell. But he gives me heaven. Blaspheming his name. And he heals me. I'm constantly failing and falling on my face and sinning against God. And he still forgives me. To show that I, I could never, ever, ever be so far. I could be outside the grace of God. There's literally nothing I could ever do to be outside the grace of God. While I'm still breathing, while my heart is still beating, while the brain neurons are still firing, His mercy is still upon me. He reaches down and heals Malchus' ear. What does Jesus do? He stops the violence. Peter, put up thy sword in thy sheath. Put your sword away. What are you doing? It's not by violence. It's not by force. It's by grace. It's not by force. It's by mercy. It's not by force. It's by meekness. It's not by violence. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not physical. They're not tangible. They're not material. It's by the kingdom of God. We speak the name of Jesus and they all fall backwards. We speak the name of Jesus and it knocks the wind out of their sails. We preach the love and the peace and the mercy and the grace of Jesus and we turn the other cheek. We let them nail our hands. We let them spit on us. We let them curse us. We let them say and do whatever they want. Because it's in the goodness of God they see His power. In the goodness of God they see His hand of mercy and grace. It's not in violence. It's not in force. 
It's not in aggression. It's not in anger. It's in meekness. Meekness is having in your hand the ability to destroy, but rather you choose to bless. That's meekness. You have the ability to call down the fire of heaven, but rather you call down the blessing. Why? Because they know not what they do. If they knew, if the world knew who it was that they were cursing, who it was they were fighting against, they'd fall flat on their faces and repent immediately. They'd immediately start shaking uncontrollably and screaming for mercy if they knew. If they knew who it was they fought against. If their eyes could be just open just for a split second and they could catch a glimpse of the throne of God, they'd immediately be crying out. They know not what they do. Pity them. Grieve for them. Rather seek to open their eyes because as they are, you once were. You were once, I was once like them. Have no, had no idea. So remember, remember that. How the goodness of God called you. How the goodness of God showed you mercy. Showed you grace. Showed you meekness. Showed you love. Showed you goodness. As they are, you once were. As you are. They shall be if you show them Jesus Christ. If you show them the power of Jesus Christ. Jesus reaches down and heals the ear of Malchus. Then the band and the captain, the officers of the Jews, took Jesus and bound him. Some people just have such a coldness, have such a hard heart that they could witness such a beautiful thing of the goodness of God, healing the sick, answering the prayers, changing the lives, changing a blasphemer, a drunkard, a murderer, a, 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 a sinner, and turning them into a saint of God. And what do they do? What does the world do? What does society do? What do the governments do? What do the schools do? What does society do? They bind the hands of God. All he did, these hands, those hands of Jesus that raised the dead, the hands of Jesus that opened the eyes of the blind, the hands of Jesus that turned the water to wine, the hands of Jesus that fed the thousands. The hands of Jesus that healed the lepers. The hands of Jesus that brought the teachings and the, and the doctrine and the gospel of salvation. The hands of Jesus that held the hands of the disciples. That held the hands of the widow woman. That held the hands of the children. The hands of Jesus that never ever did violence. That only healed that only brought good things. They bind them. They bind the hands of Jesus. But what does he do? What does Jesus do when they bind his hands? He lets them. He lets them. He lets them bind his hands. They took Jesus and bound him and led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest the same year. Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That's John. Humble John. Humble John always gets me. Every time I read the Gospel of John, I always find it kind of funny. How humble and... 
how humble John was in that he would never reference himself. So when you read the Gospel of John and it says, and that other disciple, that's how he addresses himself. And that other disciple, John, was known unto the high priest and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door without, then went out that other disciple, which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door and brought in Peter. Okay, now it's very interesting when you read these details like this. So think about this just for a moment. John, John, who was a disciple of Jesus Christ, was well known by the high priest. Everybody knew who John was. Everybody knew who John was. And John even had authority to allow the gates of the high priest's palace to be opened to Peter. So everybody knew who John was, and they knew he was a disciple of Jesus Christ. And he wasn't afraid. He didn't care. Everyone knew. We see two complete different attitudes here between John and Peter. Watch this. So John, a disciple of Jesus Christ, known of the high priests, known of all the others, goes and opens the gate for Peter. Then the damsel that's at the gate there, and the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, said, Art not thou also one of this man's disciples? And he saith, I am not. Some people can follow Christ, be a disciple of Christ, and are very, very terrified of confrontation. Very, very afraid. Now, why would people be afraid? Why? Well, afraid of violence, afraid of confrontation, afraid of negativity. Well, nobody wants that. No, nobody wants that. But that's, that's something that we have to learn to overcome. We have to learn to overcome. And it can be very difficult for some. We've got to be very careful about looking down at other Christians that might struggle with this point. John was very bold. When John was very bold, Peter was timid. Peter was a big man, too. It's very interesting. Peter was a big man. He was a very strong man. Very big, strong man. Very, very impetuous. He would just do things. Say things. He would just bull in like a, a bull in a china shop. John was a little man. And John was more bold than Peter when it came to the faith. Peter was very outspoken and very bold and out front about everything else. But when it came to the faith, he was very timid. So it goes to show that size and appearance means nothing. Faith is a completely different thing. The Christian faith is on the spiritual plane, not the physical. The weapons of our warfare have no reflection on the physical. And that it doesn't matter how strong you are, how big you are, how knowledgeable you are, how well-versed you are, or anything else like that. It, it matters how much you trust the Lord. If you trust the Lord, you'll have no fear outwardly. You'll speak the truth and you won't care what the consequences are. You'll stand for the Lord and it doesn't matter what anyone else could say. You stand for the Lord and you preach the truth. Even the gates of hell cannot prevail against you. John was one of those. Peter, a big man, very forceful, a leader, a natural leader. But when it came to the faith, he was very timid and fearful. Even when a woman, a little damsel, asks him. Big Peter. A little damsel says, are you one of Jesus' disciples? And he says, no, I'm not. 
fearful, scared of retribution. And the servants and officers stood there who had made a fire of coals, for it was cold. And they warmed and they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. The high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. Here we go. Jesus answered, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort. And in secret have I said nothing. Why askest thou me? Ask them which heard me what I have said unto them. Behold, they know what I said. And when he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answerest thou the high priest so? So they start grilling Jesus about his doctrine. He says, well, if you don't believe me, then ask the people that I taught. They know everything I said. And they slap Jesus right across the face. It's amazing how society today slaps Jesus across the face constantly. Every time someone misuses the name of Jesus as a cuss word, it's a slap in the face. Why? Why would you do that? Every time society curses God and directly goes against God, mocks God, mocks the faith, mocks the Christians, mocks the churches, curses God, hates the Bible, they slapping God right across the face. What has he ever done to receive such hate? What has God ever done to receive such negativity? Why are they using the names of God as blasphemy? Even OMGs is blasphemy. Why would you use mentions of the names of God in irreverence like that? Why would you hate Jesus? All he ever does is speak truth. All he ever does is help and provide and save and guide and bring hope and comfort to the lost and answers prayers. All he ever does is good. He does no evil. He cannot sin. He cannot lie. He will never go back on a promise. He keeps his promises. And when he speaks truth, when he says something of truth, they slap him across the face. They kick God out of the government. They kick him out of the school. They kick him out of society. And they mock God openly in the streets. And they blame God when bad things happen. And they praise man when good things happen. But they wonder why bad things happen. They slap Jesus across the face. And Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why smitest thou me? Now what does Jesus say to the one who slapped him across the face? He says, If I've said or done anything wrong, show me what I've said or done that was wrong. If I've only done that which is good, why are you slapping me? Notice he doesn't curse the man. He doesn't look at the man with the eyes that see all eternity. He doesn't look at the man with those eyes and then condemn him to hell right there and engulf him in flames or remove the breath of life or completely obliterate him with a snap of his fingers. All he does is he looks upon the man and asks him a simple question. Why did Jesus not condemn the man for striking him? Because you know what Jesus said. All sins shall be forgiven them to the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewithsoever they shall blaspheme. That man could have been forgiven for slapping Jesus across the face. He still could have been saved. Saul became Paul. 
Remember? Saul became Paul. Slaughterer of the church. Blasphemer of Jesus Christ. Hater of God's church. Dragging people off to dungeons and prisons and having them killed. Torturing them so that they would blaspheme the name of Jesus Christ and then killing them. And he became the Apostle Paul. God's grace knows no limits. Jesus was slapped across the face. And what did he do? He just asked him a simple question. Why? Because they're silly. That's why. Because they're ridiculous. Pray for them which persecute you. That's right. So Jesus, if I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. If you're cursing the name of God, Explain to me why. What did God ever do to deserve you to curse his name? What did Jesus ever do for you to use his name as a cuss word? Why? Why do you do that? Now Annas had sent him bound unto Caiaphas the high priest. And Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. They said therefore unto him, Art not thou also one of his disciples? And he denied it. And said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off, saith, Did not I see thee in the garden with him? Then Peter denied again, immediately the cock crew. Now, you'll notice that Peter was one of the most fervent, fervent disciples of Jesus Christ. One of, one of the most impetuous individuals who loved Jesus so much. You know, Peter was a saved man. Well, how do you know? If you look back when Jesus said to Peter, Peter, but whom sayest thee that I, that I am? And Peter says, Thou art the Christ. And Peter believed in Jesus as the Christ. He was the Son of God, God the Son, God manifest in the flesh. Peter believed that, and he loved him, and he believed in him, and he trusted in him. Peter was saved. Uh, well, there's many false books out there. Now, Peter was a saved man. But when the pressure was applied... He denied. Think about that one for a moment. When the pressure is applied, he denied. That happens to a lot of us. Now, this can also... This can also be applied in aspects where not just outwardly, verbally, where you might deny the faith or you might refuse to witness. But you know you can deny the Lord through giving in to sin. Yes, the gospel of Barnabas is false. Absolutely. We, we deny the Lord by our giving in to sin. When we choose sin over righteousness... And by way of our entertainment, lifestyle, hobbies, interests, work life, home life, private life. Think about that one for a moment. We could deny the Lord by our own entertainment. That's a scary one, actually, when you think about it. We blame Peter and we think that's such a horrible thing. How could you deny the Lord like that? Well, we do that almost daily. When we give in to unbiblical entertainment, unbiblical behavior, unbiblical speech, unbiblical thinking, we deny the teachings of God and deny His righteousness because we've kicked it out, pushed it aside, and accepted something else into our being for the moment. Denying Him through action, not just through words. We've got to be careful about being quick to point the finger in that way. And Peter denied the Lord three times. 
three times in a row to multiple people. Now, some people could blame him for that, for denying the Lord, but we see Peter and Judas. Judas denied the Lord and Peter denied the Lord. But what do we see here? Remember the prodigal son? The parable of the prodigal son? The prodigal son denied his father. Went off into the world and squandered it in riotous living. Living with, living with the pigs in the pig pen. But, but what do we see happening here? What does the Bible teach that, about the saints? That if you believe on the Lord, what will happen? In, in, within you, you'll have the witness, the testifier. You'll have the Spirit of God convicting you. What happened to Peter the moment he denied the Lord the third time in the cock crew? What did he do? Well, according to the scriptures, it says that when the cock crew, Jesus looked up from where he was and looked at Peter. And Peter immediately wept bitterly. Ran out and wept bitterly and repented. We see conviction. Conviction upon Peter. There is no real conviction of sincerity upon Judas. He never believed upon the Lord. He never repented for his sin. He was a sorry for the problem he caused, but he never actually repented of his sin. The same as the repentance of Esau. The repentance of Esau, which I hated, the Lord says, because it, there's no sincerity of the heart of sin. Esau was a sorry for the problem. He was, he was not sorry for the sin. Judas is not sorry for, sorry for the sin. He was sorry for the problem. Peter was sorry for the sin. He wept bitterly and begged God to forgive him. So you see, saints can make mistakes. Saints can do really, really, really stupid things. In a moment of pressure, in a moment of confrontation, a saint could even possibly deny the Lord under the pressure. A saint can do something real stupid, could fall into even a sin for a moment. But the Holy Spirit will convict you and cause you to go and weep bitterly in the Spirit and seek the Lord for forgiveness. You always know that was wrong. You always want to come back to the Lord in sincerity. You always want to try to overcome this sin and this trouble. You may fall back into it again and again and again. And you hate yourself even more every single time. But you keep coming back to the Lord and that's the whole point. You can never outdo the mercy of God. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God's forgiveness is infinite. We know we're not worthy of it. And every time we come crawling back to the Lord in, in great fear, but the hand of the Lord reaches down and picks us up and says, Fear not. You're mine. I will never cast thee away. Let's keep going. The Lord picks us up. As we read in the Psalms, again and again and again and again and again, all throughout the Psalms, the psalmist writes, and the Lord picked me up. The Lord picked me up. Because I have not the power to stand on my own. Leave me to my own well-being for five minutes, I'll fall again. But the Lord picks me up. The Lord's mercies are new every morning. Peter wept bitterly for his sin. Then led they Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment. Isaiah 53. He was taken from prison and from judgment. 
Isaiah chapter 53, verse 8, And he was taken from prison and from judgment. And they led Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment. And it was early, and they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Now it was the Passover time. And they, as being great, mighty hypocrites, illegally detaining Jesus, illegally hauling him off to interrogation in the night, which according to Mosaic law was not proper. They were supposed to wait until day and then set up an actual official legal quorum to question him and to see what was all going on properly, but they went against the law. They actually broke the law to try to defend the law. So it shows my, mighty hypocrites of the Pharisees here. So Isaiah 53, and he, he was taken from prison and from judgment, and they took Jesus from the hall of judgment. Verse 29, Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring ye against this man? And they answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up to you. I'll, I'll answer that one in a moment. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so look, look at this. Okay, what does Pilate say? Pilate says, What accusation bring ye against this man? Okay, listen very carefully to this. What accusation are you making against Jesus? Why do you hate him? What did he do wrong? Why are you condemning him? Why are you cursing his name? And the answer is that if he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up to you. That's not an answer. Ask society. What is it about Jesus that you hate? Why are you hating him? Why are you cursing him? Why are you preaching against him? Why are you condemning him? Well, if he wasn't, if he did, we wouldn't be doing this if he wasn't guilty. That's not an answer. Society will never actually give you a real reason as to why they hate him so much. They actually don't know why they hate him so much. They actually don't know why. They just do. So the Jews didn't actually give Pilate a proper answer. Then Pilate said unto them, Take ye him and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. Now things just got really serious all of a sudden. They want to kill him. They want to kill him. Okay, again, just to emphasize again what it is that's actually happening here. If you remember, I, I walked you through the book of Judges, then through Malachi, then through John the Baptist and Jesus and Stephen and all these things showing you from the Bible how the, how the Pharisees knew flat out. They knew full well, 100%. They knew that Jesus was the Messiah and they didn't care. Again and again and again and again, the Pharisees say, who are you? And Jesus says, the same as I've always told you, you know who I am. He told them again and again and again and showed them again and again and they knew full well, they knew since his birth. They knew since his birth who he was. They knew full well who Jesus was and they didn't care. They didn't care. They want to kill him. Verse 32, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. Go back to Isaiah chapter 53. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. 
Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Now, if we actually study that one out, we see that according to the line of the kings from King David, Joseph, as in Joseph and Mary, Joseph, Jesus' adoptive father, Joseph was of the line of David. Joseph was of the bloodline of King David. Now, Jesus, Jesus, it's interesting when you do a study on biology. The blood of the baby does not come from the mother. The blood specifically, the blood DNA, the blood itself does not come from the mother. It comes from the father. Who is Jesus' father? God, the king of kings, the king of kings. Now, Joseph was of the bloodline of King David. And Jesus was adopted by Joseph as Joseph's own son. Now, when we actually look at this, then, according to law, legally, technically, by law, when Joseph then died, as Joseph was of the bloodline of King David, Joseph would, was next in line to be king of Israel, technically. And technically, when Joseph died, the throne then would be inherited by Jesus. So technically, legally, Jesus was the rightful king of Israel. So Pilate, Pilate says, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus ends it. Well, see, the thing is, Jesus is still alive. So he's still the king of Israel. Jesus answers Pilate. Pilate says, Are you the king of Israel? Jesus says, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it, th tell it thee of me? He basically says to Pilate, why are you asking? <laughs> Pilate says, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, why? Why are you asking? Pilate says, am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? What have you done? Now look at the mob out there, all riled up. They want you dead. What did you do? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. Pay attention to the specific words. Jesus says, My kingdom. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would not my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews? But now is my kingdom not from thence. What is Jesus then saying? What did Pilate ask him? 
Are you a king? Are you a king? What does Jesus say? My kingdom? Um, what is Jesus then claiming to be the king of kings? Jesus is claiming to be the king of kings. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, he did. Jesus is claiming to be the king of kings. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Is that what you're saying? Are you a king then? Jesus says, Thou sayest that I am a king. Do you realize what that means? When you read this in verse 37, Thou sayest that I am a king. In the actual Greek, if you actually go back to the Greek manuscripts and you take a look at this verse, the way it's worded, It says, thou sayest that I am a king. What he's actually saying in the Greek is, I am what you say, a king. That's actually how you actually say that. I am as you you are saying, a king. I am what you are saying. That's what Jesus said right there. So Jesus flat out says to Pilate right there, he flat out says, yes, I am. I am a king. To this end was I born. Look what Jesus says. To this end was I born. Isaiah 53. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. Isaiah says he's born for this purpose. He'll be born for this purpose. He'll be born of a virgin, born in Bethlehem. He'll be called the mighty God. And he'll be put to death for our sins. For this purpose was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? Does he not realize who he's talking to? What is truth? What did Jesus say? I am the truth. It's kind of funny. Truth is staring him square in the face. He doesn't realize it. Until later. I'll get to that in a bit. Truth can stare us in the face sometimes. People can read the Bible over and over and over and over and over and over. And they don't get these subtle things. They don't get the simplicity of it. They can read the whole Bible and not realize this is who Jesus is. They can read the whole Bible and know all about it all their life. And they think that it's by works or something. Or some other thing. They, they can grow up in the church and they'll never, they're not actually saved. And it's, just, it's amazing how truth can stare people square in the face and tell them flat out what it says and they just don't get it. Because they don't want to get it. They suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They change the truth of God into a lie and they worship and serve the creature more than the creator. They hate God. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. When all creation can stare people in the face and they can say, it it evolved. It's amazing how people can twist the truth. What is truth? Where is truth? What is truth? Pilate said unto him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and said unto them, I find in him no fault at all. But ye have a custom 
that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber and a murderer. They would rather a sinner be released unto them. They would rather believe in and follow and protect sin rather than Jesus. They would rather condemn the king, spit in the face of God, than believe on him. Think about this. Look at all the details of this. Now the story doesn't end there. If you want, I'll leave it up to you folks. We can take just a quick intermission. And we can come back and do chapter 19 if you want. What would you like? Yeah? Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right, so let's take a little, little intermission. We can freshen up our coffee and all of that, and we'll be back in five minutes. Back in five minutes, and we'll do chapter 19. All right, folks, there you go. So God bless all those who love our Lord God, Jesus Christ. God bless all those who love his holy word. Hope to see you again, folks. Lord will be back in five minutes, and we'll do chapter 19. And as always, folks, if I don't see you again, I'll see you in the sky. God bless.